we have a talk by Dr. Subhashish Panja. He's from National Physical Laboratory, the laboratory which is responsible for keeping the standards of time and frequency and various other things. He will be talking about single trapped iron based physical frequency standard. Shubhash. Yeah. So, good morning to everyone. And as Unni already told, that I am from CSR NPL, that is the National Measurement Institute. And I am going to talk about the trapped iron based optical frequency standard or an optical atomic clock, and the possible way of redefining SI second. So, before going to this subject, I will take an overview. Uh, uh, how how the timekeeping society or how the yeah, the timekeeping technique is evolving over the period of several years, let's say fifty years, and how the SI definition of uh, second it is it is realized through different kind of clocks or atomic clocks. And on top of that, I'll briefly discuss about the role of CSR NPL as the National Meteorology Institute. How will maintaining or keeping our Indian standard time as well as the contributing to the international time that is called UTC, Universal Coordinated Time. And in a brief way, so I'll, I'll go slide by slide, but not much like research as I'm not presenting, I'm giving the most of the things that, which is like, what is the trend and how we are approaching towards redefining SA second and what is the back history or the past history. Okay, so first thing is like, the interesting part of the time and frequency metrology, you see, this is the most accurately measured parameter, SI parameter. Like there are seven SI base unit, starting from the length, current, mass, and the, among these seven SI base unit, time is most accurately measured. And the other thing is, you see, since 1965, it has quantum standard. So this is the only parameter having quantum standard, like more than 50 years back. Uh, but as a national metrology institute, CSR and NPL, so they, have, they are mandated to maintain all the standards for physical parameter, including SI base units. And uh, I, mean, I think I'm not going to talk about all these parameters because uh, the, the, the recent meeting in the CIPM, they have decided that the SI standard will be defined on quantum standard only. So all the artifact which measurement like mass, length, everything, so now it will be realized on the basis of some quantum standard or some of the, uh, the, 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 the cons fundamental concept, like Avogadro number for the mole, uh, Planck constant and Boolean constant. For the time, it is the CGM standard, we know. But I, I'm, I'm mostly focused on the, the time standard and how we'll realize this time at CSR NPL and what is the international protocol, then distribution of time. So that is not the end that we are just make, keeping the time very accurately. But for the end user, we have to bring it very accurately. So that is one of the prime activities. And then of course, considering the future redefinition of SI second, we are working towards developing atomic clocks, the present SI definition, the cesium fountain or cesium atomic clocks, as well as the optical clocks. So these are the things I'm going, I'm going to cover very, I mean, firstly. So now, so we are talking about the redefinition of the SI second. So from where the accurate time measurement starts, so you see, timekeeping has a very, very old history. Like in the ancient times, the Samarian used to keep time on the basis of megalithic observation, like, like obelix or something like we see in the Egyptian civilization. But the time with the second hand or minute hand, it started in late 17th or 18th century when the Dutch scientist Hygiene, he explained the working principle of a pendulum clock. So this is the really, we could measure the time with the accuracy of minutes and seconds in the 18th century. But the problem with the pendulum clock, it is not transportable. But for sea navigation, you need a transportable clock. But in the 18th century, the British took, they need a transportable clock. So then like the like similar like the quantum mission today, by that time, the British emperor, they, the scientific advisory committee of the Queen, they announced that they need a very stable, accurate atomic clock. And they announced the award money of 2000 pounds by that time. As Sir Isaac Newton was the head of that committee, and you see, this was the first mechanical clock. It was invented by this. This is he was, Harrison was a carpenter by profession. So 1761, that is the first mechanical clock, which can be transported. So they can put it in the ship. So this was the real uh, time that transportable clock was invented. 
But then the, it is a game changer in 1929 when this piezoelectric effect comes into play. So people started keeping time with the quartz. Nowadays, everybody has quartz clock. So since 1929, after the invention of the piezoelectric effect, we have the quartz clock. And now I'm coming back to the CSR NPL, our National Metrology Institute. So it was in, established in 1947. So since 1950, we are keeping time using a, the ring oscillator. This is called SN ring quartz oscillator. It's a quartz based oscillator. See such clock was using to keep our national time. That's Indian standard time or UPC, whatever it is. But okay, the real atomic era starts in 1955. So our, our main motive is here. So these two gentlemen, SN and Pedi, you see the SN ring, the person who was involved in building this quartz oscillator, he is the mastermind again, building this first atomic clock. The SN and Pedi at NPL UK, they built the first atomic clocks based on the cesium atoms, hyperfine transition at 9.2 gigahertz. And then, then it was declared as a primary standard for the SI second in 1965. And we got the first atomic clocks at NPL around 74. And this, this, is, this is the first time perhaps in the country that we got the first atomic clock and we started keeping time using the atomic clocks. Now, what is atomic clock? I, I don't need to tell in detail, but still it's like some of the atomic transitions, very special narrow line transition. You have an oscillator and you can lock the frequency of the oscillator. So you can keep it locked at the top of the transition frequency. So this is referred as the transition frequency and it is very stable. And you can count time using this frequency and it displays, so this is the atomic clock. This is the generic principle of the atomic clocks. So any kind of atomic clock you use, you need a, like an, a, 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 atoms or species for integration and you lock an external oscillator to that species and that frequency is used for counting time. So this is, and now for cesium we see, it's simply like we are producing cesium atom here and this is a, this is two state of the grounds, uh, hyperfine state of F3 and F4. So there is a state selection, F3 is passed through the cesium microwave cavity. And if you tune the frequency of the microwave, when you see the maximum absorption is occurring, so that is the frequency of the clock. So this is the simple principle, I'm not going in detail, but, and we see this is the now modern days of the cell available commercial atomic clocks. And it, it gives uh, fractional frequency uncertainty of 10 to the power minus 12. This is the kind of stability it can provide. It means that if you run such a clock over a period of 30,000 years, then only you have a chance to make an error of one second. So you can lose or you can gain one second time if you continuously run this kind of clock for over 30,000 years. That is not possible. You never lose a one second of time. But this is just to overview how accurate this kind of academic clocks are. But that is, this is not the end of the story. If you see that this is the, I mean, schematic, the, the, Atoms are passing through this cavity here and it's taking a time of delta t. So this is a U-shaped specially designed cavity. I mean, that, that is some reason. I will, if time permits, I'll explain that later. But let's say that the atom stays within the cavity for a time of delta t. But from, from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you know that this is the constant delta t and delta t, delta e. So if you have a higher uncertainty in t time, so you have lesser uncertainty in frequency. It means if the atoms can pass through the cavity for a longer period of time, you have a narrow frequency length. I mean, you have lesser uncertainty in frequency. This is the this is the thumb rule. This is the principle. So how we can make this atom to spend more time in the cavity? Either you can increase the length of the cavity, you make a big longer tube, or you can make the atom slower so that atoms take much more much long time to travel. So this is the two principle. So like you have a very fast atoms, let's say let's say 100 meter per second, this is the atomic velocity, thermal atoms. So we have a frequency uncertainty like 100 mega, 100 hertz. But now, if we either increase the cavity length or make the atom slower, it takes, let's say, one second instead of 100, uh, uh, sorry, instead of one millisecond, it's like 100 milliseconds. So you can reduce the frequency uncertainty. So that is the principle. And that's exactly, you see, it is just done in NIST and PTV by the, uh, based on very long cavity based atomic clock. So you have a very long, like three meters long cavity, and you can improve the stability as well as accuracy of the clocks by a few hundred times. But can you make it further better and by, by making it long and long? No, because this atomic beam has a, some, some sort of divergence. So after a certain time, 
it will start colliding on the wall. So you can further you will lose signal. So your experiment will not work better. Then it will be getting worse. So there, there is some limitation. So people found that this is the limit. But on the other way, there is a possibility you can make the atom slower. So that it goes very slow and takes much longer time. So people are confused how to get or how to prepare slow atoms. Then 1980s, after the invention of the laser cooling technique, so it all started clicking. So people started working with the laser cooled based atomic standard. This is called cesium fountain. I, I'll tell you why. So if this is standard like cooling laser in the mod timber here. You have a cloud of the cold atom and you give a slowly push towards the off and you see the microwave gravity is steady here. The atom goes up and comes down. So it takes a long time to go pass through the microwave gravity towards up and again coming back. So in that way, you have a very long interaction time and have a very narrow line with uncertainty in the frequency. So this is the cesium fountain at a CSR NPL uh, and our, our, I mean, one of our senior member, Dr. Amitabh Sengupta was the person who was dealing with this activity in a long time back, like 2015, it was in operation. And it, it contributed to some of the international time scale time that will come later. I, I don't know whether it will work. I'm probably it will not work. So this is a kind of small cartoon or animation. It shows that atoms are getting laser cooled here and tossed up. So it's going up towards the cavity and coming back. So it looks like a spreading the atoms after going up. So it looks like a fountain. So that's why it is called cesium fountain. So and in and, and the recent time and, 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 and presently, Cesium fountain clock is the primary standard of second. So it is nothing but same like microwave cesium clock, but it based on the laser cooled atoms. So this is the standard of the time. But now people are thinking to make it further better. How it will be done? That, that we'll discuss later. But how this atomic clock are used to keep time? These are the laboratory achievement. Now. You have all these good atomic clocks sitting in the laboratory. But how will will make it usable to the other people, other community? Like many of the society, like many of the organizations, like Department of Telecommunication, ISRO, they, they, they need very accurate time. And this should be UTC traceable. So I will briefly discuss how the international community keeps the time and what is the role of NPL and India and, and the international counterpart also. So first, we, have, we know that the parent body is the BIPM. It's, in, it's located in Paris. And we have different NMIs across the globe, like NPL in India, PTV in Germany, NIST in, in, in USA. So every NMIs of the country, they have an ensemble of atomic clocks and they do intercomparison and send their data to BIPM. So it's like 500 atomic clocks, around 80 to 90 laboratories in the world are distributed. So they send their atomic clocks data to BIPM. And BIPM evaluate the performance of each and individual clocks and give some weightage. If some, some of the clocks are still really performing better, they give 100% weightage. So it is like weighted average of the atomic clocks. So they combine them with the algorithm. So all 500 clocks is averaged and getting an average value up. And this is a paper clock actually. It's, it's not really exist like a clock. So they take the average value, make a paper clock. This is called free atomic time and it's as French abbreviation is EL. Now I told you the cesium fountain is the primary standard. So that need to be bring in the loop. So this EL, the free atomic time is calibrated using some of the cesium fountain. Cesium fountain is very difficult to run 24 seven. So it's just time to time being operated and calibrated. So after calibration, after contribution of the cesium fountain, it become international atomic time. And now from the very old times, we have the tradition of keeping time on the base of the rotation of earth to the observatory. And that is the most practical way, actually. That is more, but atomic clocks are the most accurate one. But the practical thing is like, if you really monitor something like, which is in a reality, like that's the rotation of the earth. So these two time scales need to be in synchronized. I mean, they need to be in coordination. So what we see, if the time which is kept in, 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 in comparison to the rotation of the earth and the time kept with the atomic clocks, they are separated by, deferred by 0.9 seconds. So then leap second is added. Like, like we have a leap year, we, we add one day. So here also we add leap second in a certain period of time. When the time difference between the two the time keeping system is like 0 0.9 9 nanosecond, sorry, 0.9 second. So this is after addition of the leap second, we get the universal coordinate time. So you see that it's contributed by all the NMIs. So what we do, we contribute from the NPL 
at the same time, we keep our local UTC. What, in, what BIPM is doing with 500 clocks, we do with like less number of clocks, but the same exercise you do at NPL. So that is called UTC NPL, local UTC. And which is traceable, we do intercomparison. BIPM publish their, their, their report every month or every week. That is called UTC rapid or UTC circular T. And we get our status, the performance of the clock and where we are standing. So this is, the, yes. It's, it's presently fountain is not in operation. So, so we have it's a downtime. So it is purely on the basis of the commercial clock like cesium, uh, cesium beam clock and, and active hydrogen measure and passive hydrogen measure. And then we have, I am talking about the UTC and it is UTC NPLI, what do you do in India? So we have five such cesium clock here. These are the beam clocks, not uh, this commercial clock. And this is the active hydrogen measure here. And we have some passive measure also recently addition. So we, we, we ensemble them and get the weighted average. And as a steered output of the hydrogen measure, we realize the UTC NPLI. And this hydrogen measure is traceable to BIPM. BIPM always give us the status that how much we are far from this UTC and all these things. So we need to do all the correction, frequency correction, phase correction, all these things we do. So that's a lot of detail about the programming and all these things. So now this is the satellite communication we use to establish link with UTC, like BIPM and other community. So it can be done through the geostation satellite based and also the navigation satellite, like GPS and all these things. So this is the experimental setup we have at our, our uh, antennas on the rooftop and this is in the laboratory. But we see that this is a very strategic thing. It's length and other things that you can do comparison in, in discrete. But timekeeping is a thing. You have to do it in continuous. You can't miss it now. Like every second you have to get. So that's why if single time scale, we have some single point failure. So every entire system will collapse. And BIPM will assign you six month waiting time if you have something wrong. So that's why you have another secondary backup time scale. So it, it, it's like redundancy for purpose. So these two time scale are located in two different buildings, and we have established an optical fiber link between the two time scale to make traceability. And instead of two fiber, one fiber you see that is the two fibers. So because it is like phase stability fiber link. So the second loop is the it it, it measures the phase variation, and this this link uncertainty we can reduce up to like few hundred picosecond. So it's like that. This two, they are the same exactly within few hundred picosecond apart. So the, in two different buildings, they are seamlessly operating. If something goes wrong with the primary one, this will take up. So this is the purpose. It's the same, same architecture. Well, and then I, as I told that after keeping time, we have that responsibility to transfer the time for the end user. Like somebody, some of the uh, public workstation or uh, computer and the network, they need time with the accuracy of millisecond, not much. So they simply can use the network time protocol. It's the internet-based time transfer. We can get a millisecond. There is some land-based precision and this white rabbit I have talked you need a dedicated fiber link, then you can get picosecond accuracy. But if somebody is sitting far away from our, our, our laboratory, like thousand kilometers, so you can't have a like, a like physical connection, like fiber or all this, very difficult. So then we use this global navigational satellite. It can be GPS, it can be GLONASS, or it can be Indian regional navigation satellite, what ISRO has launched. It is called IRNS, Indian Regional Navigational Satellite System, or NAVIC, navigation through Indian constellation. Or we have two-way satellite. Two-way satellite will not prefer because it 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 it, it, it costs a lot of money. And on top of that, you need to get a licensing for the satellite transponder, all these things. But it's easiest to use like GPS or, or navic. So how you do like as I have already told, ISRO has its own satellites, navigation and satellite. And that as per international norms, they need to be traceable to the UTC. But being custodian of UTC. NPL has the responsibility to give time to ISRO also. So what do we do? So this is like a timing laboratory at NPL and ISRO has two timing center. One at Bangalore, is like Bangalore and another is Lucknow. So there we actually, we, we, what do we do? At NPL, we continuously monitor the time difference between the GPS onboard clock to NPL clock. And same exercise is done by ISTRAC, uh, the ISRO at Bangalore and Lucknow. So they compare their time with the satellite time. So it is like you have a common reference. You are comparing your time with that reference. I am also comparing. So later in post-processing, they'll tell, okay, for today, our time is like five nanoseconds ahead of the GPS time. We'll tell that now our time is 
lacking by five nanoseconds. So in practically, we are 10 nanosecond apart and we can do the correction. So it is like every day size and is no time. And for the strategic reason, I, the recent data I can't share, but I can show some of the old initial data where we can see the ISRO time, the two of the time scale, Bangalore and Lucknow, they are following NPL time with like 10 to 50 nanoseconds within the uncertainty. So this is this is this is one of the things. Now, so so far we have discussed only about the cesium atomic clocks and, and the timekeeping business, how we uh, do it at, at NPL as well as BIPM, and how the time is being utilized with those different techniques. Ah, uh, it's ionospheric delay and multipath that they are dominating. There are many other things, but the ionospheric delay that is that's the signal is coming from like satellite to the, the Bangalore and from satellite to the NPL. There are different layer of ionosphere. So they're they delay cranes. Yeah. And second thing is like your your antenna where it is located. If something nearby there's a big tall trees or building, so some of the reflected signal is coming back. So that creating some additional path delays. So these are the small small, small uh, things, but adding nanosecond of uncertainty. So, what, but there is a process that they like called post-processing. There actually we can go to like one nanosecond or two, to two nanosecond, but it's all post-processing, not, not you can do in and immediately you can't do. Yeah. That, that, is, that is kind of, we do the correction, of course, that is the dual frequency GNSS receiver we mostly use. But still, it is not 100% corrected. So that for that is the precise positioning is also very much required. So that's the PPP processing is following. So we will do it in later part. Okay. Yes. Anybody else? No. Okay. So now we, we left there that we have cesium clock or the laser pool cesium. Cesium fountain is the primary standard of time right now. Then is there any possibility that we can make it further better? Of course, there is requirement. There is requirement for many of scientific research. Are many of the application, but can we make it? Vivid? Yes, there is. A, I mean, this thing is very well known for last 10, 15 years. That optical clock is coming. What is optical clock? Like cesium, we use this microwave as a transition frequency. But now, if we go optical domain of the frequency region as a, as a transition frequency, that is called optical atomic clock. So for cesium or rubidium, like microwave clocks, that operational frequency is roughly 10 to the power 10 hertz. And if you see the accuracy or the stability in terms of LN division here, the delta nu by nu, that's the quality factor. If you have higher operational frequency, like from 10 to the power 10 hertz to 10 to the power 14 hertz, like hundreds of terahertz. So if you go to this frequency higher, then of course the inaccuracy goes down. So you have a more better clock. So that is the possibility. And it's not very new. It's like last decades people are doing and there are number of species, people are interrogating both ions and atoms. We can see here we have this iterbium ion, strontium ion, mercury ion, aluminum ion, and there are some other candidates also. Similarly, there are lots of atoms. And how they do, I mean, this is two very well-known and very popular technique. While we are talking about the atoms, people use optical lattices. So you can interrogate a very large number of atoms there. So you have a very good signal to noise ratio. But while you're talking about ions, it is a single ion because you see that ions are charged particles. So you can't keep them together with the Coulomb repulsion and all these things they will cause some uh, inaccuracy. So you have to compromise, you have to get a single ion. And both, both are possible and they are competing there as per the performance and group. Many groups actually, they're equally preferred. And a recent time, a recent meeting of this parent body CIPM, so they are also confused. Which one to decide as the, the, as the possible candidate for the primary standard. So they say, we'll say, there is some, some certain wrong norms. We'll go with all elements, like all are secondary standard now. You just keep doing. When we'll see after a few years that a multiple number of laboratories is coming with the clocks with the same species with this many of accuracy, and they set some norms. Maybe it will be reviewed three, four years or five years after, and they'll, say, they'll come with a conclusion that this is the candidate you can define as a primary standard. These are the candidates, not single, it can be multiple also. But still it is diocese, which of the candidates, but these are the possible candidates. So keeping in that scenario, we had NPL. Uh, we, we also started working, and Subhadi was also there at the time. So we also uh, started working, developing an optical clock based on the single line of iterbium. And single line of iterbium, why suddenly iterbium? Of course, we could, we could start with any of the ions, 
because there are aluminium, <coughs> calcium, strontium, ytterbium, and mercury. <coughs> and you see the enemies, those are engaged with the iron. So everybody, I mean, many of the enemies are preferring something. And we, we that time we decided because ytterbium has two clock transition. And we see PTV and NPL UK, they have uh, demonstrated both the clock. I mean, they have very good result about that thing. Even though it's challenging, but so the, like, like the summary is that it has multiple two clock transition in the, in the optical domain. And, S two D five. I mean, what is the transition? Yeah, that will be the micro. I mean, I, if, if, if it, there's a possibility, people can try. But this, these are very well studied things. Uh, I mean, you see, uh, if you if you see among these two, this is have the highest accuracy. But still, we are not trying this one. Because we, at, the, at the beginning, we are trying something which is relatively less critical, I'll say. So once we build up our ex, uh, expertise or uh, I'll say confidence, then can we target for Once we build one, then the multi, uh, just uh, multiplying, it's not a, that big challenge, I'll say. But it's still challenging, but getting something at the first time, it's always a very big challenge. So that's why we are targeting 435 nanometer at NPL. But uh, I think Ubadeep and uh, I think Odijit also, they are also uh, trying to build uh, optical clock based on the iron. So what he was learning at Ayuka at 467 nanometer. And then what are the components, what are the major ingredients you require to build such an optical clock? So that is like, first you have to build a RF trap, not a, not a magnet of, a magnetic trap because again, magnetic field will create problems, so shifting and all these things. So you have a RF trap, this is called all trap. I think, I think most of you are aware about this. It has some different kind of geometry or configuration. It's like a ring trap, ring with a ring electrode, or it can be linear trap. But our like experiment, the optical axis is much better for this end cap type of design. So we are we are, we have gone through. We have decided to go with this end cap type of trap, and that that I'll show you some of the picture there. Then then you need lots of optical arrangement optics for doing laser cooling and photoionization and all these things. Hard part is like. Well, we are talking about the clock, clock, clocks. So it's a, always a optical transition. So you need a laser. And if the clock line with the, the frequency is like one hertz and you have a megahertz line with laser, it is no use. Like you are trying to measure one nanometer with a scale. It will be like a bad, bad. So you need a clock which is having line with up one hertz. So that's also in a big effort. We have to build a clock laser or laser with a line with a hertz with a ultra low expansion cavity. So this is another activity. You have to carry. So once everything is working, like you have trapped, laser cooled, clogged, everything in operation, then let's say the transition frequency, what I am demanding, you may demand it's a different number. Who will confirm? So then there's another te technique or another device or instrument that you can evaluate this frequency transition. Transition frequency, that's you need an optical frequency comp. So this, these are the, everything should be in operation at simultaneous position. Then only you can, Make a call clock. So I mean, we are we are not not very close, or not, not close anyway. But still, whatever we have done and whatever we are trying to do, I am presenting briefly. So first, we are producing this ion through photoionization. It is two-step photoionization. Like first, we bring this ytterbium atom to its H two P state. Then we are knocking the electron out with the photon. So two-level photo excitation. Then we are doing the laser cooling with the cyclic transition from H two P state. So it's like million times that it goes up and down, it, it loses its internal energy, you produce a cold ion. But the problem is that while doing this close cycle, this, this cycling transition, some of the ion can be and can be populated to some of the metastable states We are low lying to here. And the problem with the metastable states, it has a very long lifetime. And we are talking about single ion. And your ion is sitting some in the wrong place with a very long lifetime, and your experiment is gone. So then what you have to, you, you have to make sure by any chance, if the ions goes to the wrong place, we are pushing them there and bringing to the cooling cycle. So we have two laser here. These are called a VPAM laser. So whenever the ions are sitting in the metastable stage, the cooling will actually bring them back to the cooling cycle. So now it's a it's a full leak proof cooling, like 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 closed cycle cooling. So we have a laser cool ion. That's the, the in principle. That is the policy. And once you have everything, 
this is the two clock transition we have discussed already. So we are, we are choosing this, this dotted line for 36 nanometer. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, this is hyperparallel. Okay, so I mean, this is a, this is again a, a cartoon or, or, or like pictorial presentation how it will all together work. So this is like we have a thermal ion. So inside the trap, we have this ion is trapping, and you see because of the thermal ion, it's just in the motion. Then we have all laser with the repumping and cooling laser we are signing inside here, and we will produce a laser cooled ions. So once we have the laser cooled ion and the rest, then we uh, integrate the clock laser and we have the detector. So tuning the frequency, you measure the highest probability of the transition, and that is the clock frequency. Uh, so where we are standing, so this is our experimental setup. I, I'm the, like optics, it's a like photograph, but here we can show. This is the trap chamber. It's a, a here where we have the, the iron trap which is in house. So this is the outer diameter we can see here. That the outer diameter is like two millimeter. The inner diameter of the electrode is like one millimeter, and the tip to tip separation between them is like seven hundred micron. So you can see the complicacy. Like we have to focus five laser in seven hundred micron area with a, with an angle also. So and then then the laser had his. his own problem and people are working with laser. I'll, I'll discuss that part. But since it's a it's a RF trap, so we have to deliver high voltage RF. So this is a like trap is in house inside the inside the chamber. This is the chamber, and we are delivering high voltage RF using a helical resonator. Because if you want to deliver high voltage RF like kilovolt directly from the source, because of the impedance mismatching, it can destroy the system. It can it can burn the source. And we can inductively couple with a resonator like a transformer. But this the resonant frequency of the resonator, what I realized later, that, and that the morning we started with some frequency, but it started drifting a little bit. And that quality factor and the efficiency, it affects. So you have to have a monitoring system. Okay, we have the highest efficiency of a person. If something goes wrong, so there is a, there, there like a feedback loop. So we just monitor it. So we take the reflected signal back with the isolator and monitor it with a spectrum laser or oscilloscope. So I can show you like this, the, with, a, with a coupler, we take the reflection signal and we, we get this feedback to this, this uh, uh, the Python language based code that whenever the reflection signal increases a little bit, we tune the frequency of the source that we have always the laser, uh, the, the reflected signal. So, and the same thing you can do with the pickup coil also. Like you have the highest efficiency means you are delivering the maximum. So the pickup coil will pick the maximum voltage when you have the highest efficiency. The same thing we can do parallel, but you can choose one of them. So this is, this is the ex example you can see. So while we are just running it freely, you see at the morning when you have 30 dBm, the reflected signal strength, but slowly, slowly the reflected signal started increasing like 20 dB increase. I mean, it's a lot, but if you have the feedback loop, we can, we can stabilize it like within variation of 2 dBm. And same thing, we can show that this is the reflected signal base and this is the pickup coil base. But pickup coil has a very, very slow response. Even though it works, but I'll not, we prefer to have this reflected base. Okay. So one, I mean, just a few minutes back, I was discussing about the lasers. So we have so many lasers for the photo, photo, photo ionization and the laser cooling. And, and you know that the nasty, I mean, the, the kind of climate we have here, any temperature variation, some problem, the laser started drifting, and the noise level is also not very good here, and the vibration, everything we have problem. So the laser either started drifting or fluctuating, and sometimes the mode hopping. So you have to have a very robust uh, system that to do for the frequency locking. So that's why, and up to that four five, like it is not like the individual laser you can do SS to some of the atomic tension and can do like locking. So what we prefer, uh, we are using a wavelength meter, and here we are using a rubidium cell, a vapor cell, to lock or calibrate this wavelength meter. So this is the, the rubidium spectra, and these are the, some of the SAS peak. We have expanded here some of the crossover transition of the, the, the rubidium 85 FG3, and we, this is the error signal. And we, we can we can lock them any any of the uh, any of the peak. So here we can we can lock this. So why why you need a SAS peak? The, like a reference spectra of rubidium because you see. If we use this wave meter, just using its inbuilt neural lamp, 
So over a certain period of time, it started recalibrating. And you see this, this sort of noise started appearing. So it, it's not always repeated some, but it, it comes. But once we have this, this locking system, and then we have very smooth, I mean, the broadening whatever we have, but it is, it is consistent. And the same thing we have done with force all of the laser, like we have 399, 739, the repump and the pulling of everything, all laser, we simultaneously lock to them this wavelength meter with the rubidium vapor cell calibrated. And we found that they are, they are, they are staged with like few megahertz. Well, and so this is, this is the, at, at present, what we are operating like the pressure is lower part of 10 to the power minus 10, but our target is something like 10 to the power 11. So, but it is, it is not up to that level, still we can survive. And what we found that since we are using this iterbium ingots, it has different isotopes, sorry, so different isotopes. So we did this spectroscopy, we are signing the laser and detecting from this side. And we found that from the fluorescent spectra, we can isolate all the adjustment spectra of the different isotopes. So this is the re reverse spectra. So you take 71, 72, 74, 75, 76, all this isotope you can see. This is from atoms. I, I, I isotope we are getting, getting from the atoms only. So while we are doing the photo and we have to be extremely careful because if we are, because you see, you see it's, it's like within few megahertz, few ten of hundreds of megahertz. So you have to tune the frequency properly that you, you select the right isotope. And right now we are, we, we are producing the ion that, and trap and signing the uh, ionization laser and trying to trap and cool. But again, so we are fighting with some other problems. So still now, uh, the vacuum problem, vacuum system is having some problem, laser is having some, we're trying to fix them, but we are in the process of trapping and pulling out. This is the target for next step. And this, this is, I think I'm also done with the time. So I, I'm not got, going much of detail of this experimental setup, but this is how we are approaching towards building an optical clock at CSR NPL, which will be like iter beam single line based uh, optical clock and which will be used for that. And this is some of the reference or recent time publication. This is not in big journal or not many also, but anyway. And I, I of course, I mean, Subhadeep was like, our, he's also still our group member, but officially he's not there. But, and then I must acknowledge Dr. Sengupta. I mean, he was the person who actually initially thought about this experiment long time back. And then some of our students who have completed their PhD and some of the students who is working right now. And this Department of Legal Metrology, Ministry of Consumer Affairs, I have to acknowledge them because they have given a lot of money to for other purposes, not the atomic clock building. I, I don't know that that's that's like a okay. Anyway, I, that's a different study, but we got a lot of money for setting up timing laboratory. We are building five timing laboratories, in one or two of them in Bangalore also, in East and this, this RRSL Regional Research Laboratory. We are building developing two atomic clocks labor, uh, laboratory there. Then we have Guwahati, we have Faridabad, we have Bhubaneswar. So that, that's a lot of things we are doing about the timing laboratory. Thanks for attention and your presence. Thank you very much. Thanks, Subhashish. Now, uh, um, what is the reason that you're not keeping the cesium fountain clock operational? Because it's uh, more accurate than the cesium beam clock. Yes, I mean, if, if, if we could, that would be the best thing possible. I, I completely agree with it. But you see, this was the first time we built this CGM clock, and it has many loopholes in the design and all these things. So once it started, I mean, it was stopped working. So we found that I, I'm not directly involved, but what I, 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 with the discussion, came to know that many of the components started malfunctioning. So they're trying to repair them, but it, 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 it was operated for a few years at a time. Then they are also in plan of building second CGM fountain. Or of course, I agree that it should be, it would be much better if we have a continuous operation of the CGM fountain. But we are on that with limited manpower and limited resources, but we are still trying to do that. Yes. So in the iron clock, so how does um, the micro motion of the ions in the, uh, in the iron trap, it affects the accuracy of, of your time? And uh, whether you are planning to do some cooling, more cooling, like a Raman sideband cooling? No, I mean, at present, we don't. Uh, that the, our first target is to have the laser cooled ion and to integrate something with a much higher inaccuracy, maybe. So we, once we are there, but because without having anything, we can't plan further. Because I would, we are not also even very much confident about the design parameter, everything is working perfectly. Of course, I mean, these are the parameters we have to consider once we have that 
that the goal achieved. But before, I mean, we can only plan. We can only plan. We, of course, whatever you're saying, that's the thing we should do. But once we have the laser cooled iron trapped and being interrogated, not before that. But in principle, yes. I have a couple of questions. Yes. So this is again, you know, again, uh, you know, I can continue from uh, you know, Sanjukta's question. Uh, like, you know, there are proposals to use double magic wavelengths, uh, you know, for uh, like uh, trapping uh, the cesium atoms and improve the systematic effects uh, and the accuracy of uh, these cesium clocks. So, have you thought of any, you know, thought about uh, those kind of experiments? Uh, and because I, I mean, I'll not be able to give any detail about the, the proposal. I mean future plan about the cesium atomic clock or the content because I'm not directly involved on that activity. We have some other group members, but yes, I mean, in, in near future, the plan is like, now Now you have the microwave synthesis here, what we're using for the interrogating the, 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 the transition. But if you, if you generate the microwave from the optical frequency comb, that will be much lesser uncertainty. So that is the immediate plan what our colleague discussed. So I, that, but what you are saying, I, I never heard this kind of proposal. They so have there been. are two, three PRL papers on that double magic wavelengths of you know rubidium and cesium atomic I mean, clock. I, okay. I'll, I'll get this reference from you and I'll, I'll forward to my colleagues. So, uh, so uh, the other questions is like, uh, let us say if uh, uh, so, how accurate the BBR ships uh, for this cesium fountain clocks or even uh, the beam? I mean, it, it, it is overall like one part of ten to the power minus fifteen. They, they, what they achieve. That's a measurement or from the estimation? That's a measurement. But if that, that can be improved, do you think that your... Uh, I mean, for that, you have to make That's it why operation. I wanted to know the details about yeah. the systematics. I mean, then uh, you have to make it operational. Right now, that's uh, fighting to make it operational only. Yes. Okay. So the other question is related to, you know, this, uh, like, uh, the, uh, like the yttrium iron clock you have set up. Yes. And then Shobhadip has set up in uh, Pune. What's the difference, actually? No, no, no. I mean, it's different. Like, we are, we are aiming for two different transition frequencies. And of course... My main, main motive is like being in the, I based at the National Metrology Institute, build a clock first. Like, like contribute to the, the, the next SI definition of second. But Subhadip, I think, I mean, he will be better person who can explain. Question many people ask. So let's say even if technologically, both of the iron clocks will be same. Yeah. But then if you have an optical clock, how do you make sure that this clock is operation? What is the stability of the clock? You need an intercomparison. And that intercomparison initially you cannot do with an international uh, optical clocks. So it's better, I mean, it's mandatory to have at least three optical clocks in the country. It could be all three in NPL, it could be three in three different places. But what Tanya was uh, making some comment about yesterday, that getting running optical clocks, even in European Union, where there are several of them, is very difficult thing to get at this moment. So it's very, very important that as a country, we should build at least three optical clocks. So that we have a chance to intercompare when they are operational. So, okay, I have counted, but maybe we can do. Okay. So I, I had a I had a related question. So this uh, inter um, comparison, and so there will be a network, right? Yeah, of all a, the clocks. There should be a network, and for that we need an optical fiber link also. I mean that's another thing also. So so it, it means. Going back to, so you, you mentioned about the INSTR when it was not a fiber link, so there is a time delay and so on. So those uh, systematics for the time delay when you will have a link between, so they are already uh, being considered uh, parallelly? I or? mean, th while, while, while we are talking about the common view based time transfer, this is all atomic clocks of cesium level, like, like microwave mm -hmm. clock. Mm -hmm. Their accuracy is much lower than what we are talking about in terms of the optical clock. Right. But even even there also we are fighting to get the exact accuracy to transfer. Right. Even though the, now the, the, we have much improved technology, uh, technique rather than we can have a precision of like sub nanosecond. Mm -hmm. And because we, once we are getting the ephemeris data from the IGL from the next day, like the exact location of the satellite, mm -hmm. that you need because the, the timing accuracy, it, 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 you need to know the position also accurately. So then with the next day when we get the, the, the exact data from the IGL, that, that, that was the location of the satellite at that particular top time. So we can post-processing the data and can tell the accuracy with it like sub nanosecond. So for the optical clock, but that, the optical will clock that, that, that is two, have two, have two, a, two, a, two a is one of the, I, I did not cover that part because you need a geostationary satellite and a transponder is cost a lot and you have to get a license for that. And then on top of that, you have to have two timing laboratory with all this equipment and maintenance. 
and it, lots of not only money you need some trained person who can run them very carefully and uh, i mean efficiently so then only you can do all these things but it is possible, it is possible. I, we have to stop here now because it's time for the next talk you can ask later yeah i mean any time